Shalom and blessings to you. I'm Reverend Clifton McDowell Sr. I'm the pastor of the Church of God of East New York, located in the heart of Brooklyn, the East New York section of Brooklyn. We're so glad that you chose to tune in to our channel for this message. We believe that God has a word for you. We hope that you will subscribe to our channel and like us. Now let's go in and hear a great message. Jesus. The, the, story, the story is told about a man um, whose house was located in a low area of, the reg of a region and that region was being threatened by floods. Floods came and the waters rose and it rose right up to the door of the man's house. The National Guard came and um, in their four-wheel drive vehicle and they wanted to pick him up. But when they came, knocked on the door, he refused by saying, God will take care of me. When the water was about three feet deep inside the house, the Red Cross came in a motorboat, came by to rescue him, but again, the man refused, saying, God will save me. Finally, the water rose so high that he had to go up to the roof of his house, and this time, the military sent a helicopter, and as it hovered over his house, they lowered down a rope ladder to pluck him up and bring him to safety. The man again refused, saying, God will rescue me. The man soon slipped, slipped from the roof of his house, and he drowned. Hmm. When he went through the gates of heaven, he complained to the Lord, why didn't you rescue me? The Lord answered, who do you think sent the motorboat, the four-wheel drive, and the helicopter? <laughs> I believe that there's going to be many folk, many believers in heaven who will realize they missed God. They missed God's remedy. They missed his assistance. They missed his way of escape because they failed to see what God had already actually provided through people that he sent over and over and over to assist them in some way, but they got in their own way. And pride caused them to stay in their own way. I believe that sometimes the appropriate prayer is not, oh God, rescue me, but rather, oh God, open my eyes to see your presence and your provision that you've already provided for me. Songwriter says he's already provided everything we need. He's already provided. Just ask in his name. He's already provided. In the book of 2 Kings, I want you to open up your Bibles to the book of 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6, I want to begin reading at verse 8. For some of you, this is a familiar portion of Scripture, but I think it really speaks to where we are today. It says, Now the king of Aram... Which is, also, which is the Hebrew name for Syria, it's the, that region of Syria, was at war with Israel. After conferring with his officers, he said, I will set up my camp in such and such a place. The man of God sent word to the king of Israel. The man of God is Elisha. And he says, beware, tells the king, beware of passing that place because the Arameans are going down there. And so the king of Israel checked on the place, checked it out that the man of God had indicated, and time and again, Elisha warned the king so that he was on his guard in such places. This enraged the king of Aram. He summoned his officers and demanded of them, tell me, tell me which of us is on the side of the king of Israel. 
None of us, my lord, the king, said one of his officers, but Elisha, the prophet, that preacher down in Israel, he tells the king of Israel the very word you speak, even in your bedroom. Go find out where he is, it's the king orders, so I can send men and capture him. Not kill him, but capture him. The report came back, he's in Dothan. Then he sent horses and chariots and strong and a strong force there. They went by night and surrounded the city. And the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning. An army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, oh no, my Lord, what shall we do, the servant asked. Don't be afraid, prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. As the enemy came down toward him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, strike this army with blindness. So he struck them with blindness as Elisha had asked. Elisha told them, this is not the road, this is not the city, follow me and I will lead you to the man you are looking for. And he led them to Samaria. After they entered the city, Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men so that they can see. Then the Lord opened their eyes and they looked and there they were inside Samaria. When the king of Israel saw them, he asked Elijah, shall I kill them? My father, shall I kill them? Do not kill them, he answered. Would you kill those who have, you have captured with your own sword or bow? Set food and water before them so that they may eat and drink and then go back to their master. So he prepared a great feast for them. And after they had finished eating and drinking, he sent them away. And they returned to their master. So the bands from Aram stopped raiding Israel's territory. This scriptural passage is part of the historical account or historical record of the relationship or the events between um, Syria and Israel who were perpetual enemies. The historical region of Abram covers um, present-day Syria, southeastern Turkey, parts of Lebanon and Iraq. So you get that Middle Eastern geography. Damascus was the capital, and you remember Damascus. Damascus was where Paul encountered um, the risen Christ on the Damascus road. God had given Elisha supernatural knowledge and discernment of the enemy's plan. In this account, there are four distinct miracles. He gives Elisha supernatural knowledge of the enemy's plans concerning um, their military strategy. Elisha would tell the king of Israel, um, the king of, of, of Syria, of Aram, he's going to be over here, so be careful when you go down there. And the king would check it out. The king of Israel, he checked it out, and he found out that just as Elisha had said, it was so. See, the Syrian army, they were planning ambushes. They were planning ambushes like guerrilla warfare. But God is ahead of the enemy, amen? See, some folk think that the enemy, a man, is shrewder than the Lord or more cunning. Or Listen, there is nothing the enemy can do that goes unknown by the Lord. That there is no way the enemy can come up with a plan against you or against the body of Christ that the Lord is already, not already privy to. Now, this was not all out war between um, Aram and or the Syrian guerrilla fighters and Israel. This was not all out military war. It was just a strategy 
of the enemy to just, um, just hit and move, hit and move. But because Israel was warned in advance, they would either avoid the area, set up defense in the area, but either way, the enemy didn't get the upper hand. Let me tell you something. God can cause you to arrive to a place too early and, 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 and mess up the enemy's plans because now you're prepared. You see them coming. God can cause you to arrive to an area too late and if you'd have got there just a minute earlier, you would have been in the enemy's trap. You would have been, come on now, you know I'm telling the truth. You, you would have been in a crash. You would have been in something. Or God can cause you just to avoid the area all completely. Well, in a short time, it becomes obvious to the king, the enemy, um, the Syrian king, that someone's passing our plans to the enemy. He calls in his officers and he tells them, one of you, one of you is betraying us. One of you is on the side of the king of Israel. There's a traitor in our midst. There's a spy within our ranks. Someone is listening and then telling Israel where we're going to be. Find the traitor. Find the spy. Deal with it. One of his officers spoke up. Um, there's, there's no spies among us, your majesty, but there is a prophet, there's a preacher, a man there in Israel who knows and tells our every move. Begin to think about that. I wonder, um, did, did um, Nahum, Nahum, um, Naaman have something to do with that? Because remember, Naaman was an officer in the same army. And, and, and it was Naaman that came to Elisha and, and God healed him when he dipped in the Jordan, old muddy Jordan. I wonder, did he go back and tell them about this prophet in Israel? He was so, he was so overwhelmed by the God of Israel that he said, I'm not, I'm not bowing my knee to any other God. He said, even I want to I wanna erect an altar to Jehovah. Can I take some of your dirt? I don't think my dirt back home is even worthy enough to put an altar to Jehovah. So I wonder, as I read this, I wonder uh, what influence did they, um, Naaman have? And I don't know, the scripture is silent. But he says that that prophet is telling our plans. The king's response is natural. He says, deal with the problem. He says, tell me where he is. I'm going to send somebody to go capture him. It's as if in my mind he's saying, I'd rather have him on my side rather than on their side. So don't kill him. Just capture him. Bring him back. Even if he doesn't work for us, he won't work for them anymore. The king sends a contingent, a strong force of his best soldiers, horsemen and chariots, to a city called Dothan. Less than 50, 15 miles from the center or from the capital city of Samaria. It's where Elisha and, and, and some of the young men who he is mentoring are living. And the troops, they travel not by day, but they travel by night so that they can arrive early in the morning and surprise um, Elisha, give them no space, no exit route. Well... Early in the morning, one of Elisha's servants, he gets up, which is probably his natural um, habit, and he goes out to do one of his chores, and he looks around, and he sees these armies, he sees these horses, and he sees these chariots, and he is terrified. He runs back to Elisha, and he tells him about the trouble. We're in trouble. What are we going to do? We're surrounded. Elisha tells him, they go outside, he tells him, listen, you can imagine Elisha looks at the situation, looks at the soldiers, looks at his servants, and he tells his servant, those who are with us, they're more, they are more with us than are with them. Now, if I'm the servant, I'm saying, huh? 
Because I can imagine it looked like hundreds or thousands of people in those hills. And Elisha, the man of God, says, there are more with us than are with them. Then he lifts his eyes to the heavens where salvation comes from. And he prays a prayer and he says, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. The Bible lets us know that God honored that prayer. And now notice that he does not, he does not say, Lord, rescue us. That's not his prayer. His prayer is that his servant would see what has already been provided. His prayer is not, God, come to our rescue. We're in trouble. No, open his eyes that he can see that you've already provided the answer to the dilemma that we're in. Glory to God. The servant in that prayer that God answered, the servant is able to see how things really were. That the hills were full of horses and chariots of fire surrounding the enemy, surrounding Elisha. The songwriter says, it may look like I'm surrounded. It may just look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. And so the servant is able to see either what Elisha already saw or what Elisha believed by faith. Now understand this. The servant and Elisha continued to see the enemy troops. Let that sink in. The enemy troops did not disappear. They were still there. But he saw something that he did not see before. He sees an angelic host surrounding those who had surrounded them. You see, the king of Syria, the king had sent his army. But the king of kings also sent his army. And the army of the king of kings outranks, outnumbers, Anything that an earthly king can put together. Come on, shout hallelujah. And so now he sees the army of the lords and their flaming chariots, and now he sees that God had help already available and ready. Elisha the prophet and the preacher, he saw something his servant could not see. He saw that the mountains were full of the protection and the presence of God. Elisha knew what we as believers need to know or learn that in every hour of peril, in every apparent defeat, the soul that puts their trust in God is already surrounded by divine, spiritual, and physical intervention. And it's intervention that is more, as the song you sung today, that is more than enough. It is more than um, equal to whatever the situation is at hand. If we would just have eyes to see it. So my message to you this morning is what do you see? What do you see? Those of you that are at home, ask yourself, what do I see? See, because the enemy is still there. Life happens to all of us. But the question this morning to you that are in the room and you that are listening online virtually, what do you see? The trouble is we can't, we can't see for looking. We either fail to see the forest for the trees or we fail to see the trees for the forest. We, we, we lack perspective often. Either we're too close, too involved, or we're too far and too detached. Perspective. 
perspective says that we need to see things from different angles. See things from a different position, from a different point of view. We, we need to consider what's important and what's not important. And as we believe, as believers, we need to pursue God's perspective on both things and people. Have you ever noticed? Have you ever noticed that um, you and I are very good? at finding what we're looking for? You ever notice that? What you're looking for, you find. If you're looking for ugly, you find ugly. <laughs> if you're looking for beautiful, you'll find beautiful. Many of us, like Elijah's servant, have never learned to look beyond the negative and accentuate the positive. He was in a panic-stricken condition and couldn't see for looking. He, he saw an insurmountable problem, a relentless enemy, and overwhelming odds. He saw a future that held nothing but doom, gloom, and death. And yet his kind is always, has always been part of the human family. In our families, you have them, I have them. In our country, our city, our communities, our congregations, those are the people who only see the problem and have nothing but critical words to offer. Perspectives. Perspective enables us to see both the sunset as well as the earthquake. The bed of violence by the brook, as well as the hurricanes and the floods. You don't deny what you see, but you've got to see beyond what you see. We must see both sides. We, we must, we live in a nation, un, regrettably, unfortunately, we live in a nation that too often is content with seeing one side, the side that often elevates it above everybody else. It's a side that shows and records what makes our nation look good, but only shows one side of the wars, only shows one side of the experience expansion of territory. The, the, the only shows one side of what happens in exploration and discoveries while ignoring the harsh impact on people groups, families, the land, the atmosphere. It ignores the collateral damage that, that it, it impacts generations for decades got to see both sides. Elisha's servant was just doing what was normal to him to do. He was just going about his business, doing his chores, but when he looks at the enemy, he sees the difficulty but could not see the deliverer. And I wonder how much of our lives do we spend like that? We go through life, we see only the difficulty, but we don't see the deliverer. We need to pray that God would open up our eyes. And I pray, why don't you just pray that prayer right, right now for yourself. God, open my eyes. Come on, pray for yourself. God, open my eyes that I might see. Pray that God would help make visible to us the great resources that have already been provided for us or in us or around us or through us. Because you just might be the answer to a problem. Hello, somebody. But let me, let me, let me, be, let me go to the other side. <laughs> you, you just also need to consider you might also be the source of the problem. You could even be both um, the problem and the answer from God's perspective. We need to do more than simply look and see or look to see 
We need to look to consider, to analyze what we see. Because we just might see that the hills and the mountains are filled with the resources and the provision of Almighty God. Elisha then asked God to blind the enemy. It's the third miracle. Blind the enemy. And, and now, the blindness that God places on the enemy is not total blindness. It is not Helen Keller blindness. Because they're able to still follow Elijah. And so, the blindness that God um, puts on the enemy, it impacts what they saw and what they didn't see. They were blocked from recognizing Elijah when he offered to take them to the person they were after. This ain't it. This ain't the place. But if you follow me, they were blocked from seeing or recognizing the walls of Samaria when they were right up on it. And it wasn't until they were within the gates, surrounded by the armies of Israel, And so the kind of blindness that God places on them is a confusion of sight. Confuse what they were seeing. Do do you understand that God can hide you in plain sight? Y'all don't believe me. (laughs) You know what they say about, they say, they say, if you want to, if you want to hide something, put it in plain sight. Have you ever been looking for something and you go all the way around it, all over the house, looking for it, and it's right there? Nobody moved it unless you got a trickster spouse. (laughs) But it was been there in plain sight. I want to suggest to you that the Lord can hide you. Young people, young men, young women, stay with God. Because he is a refuge, he is a strong tower, he is a mighty, but he is a mighty force to go with you. And so the Lord confuses the enemy, and he's done it before. Make them look at each other and think they were the enemy in one military um, situation. They would, they start fighting each other. He he made water pits look like blood. <laughs> oh. and so the Lord brings them right into Samaria. And once inside, the fourth miracle is performed. Elisha prays again and he says, open their eyes. And they saw where they were. When was the last time you prayed that God would open the eyes of your enemy? So you you so busy trying to fight your own battle. <laughs> When was the last time you prayed, God, God, open their eyes, help them to see? You you might just um, be surprised that person who is looking for opportunities to undermine you, to trip you up, the Lord can help them to see the reality of their situation. He can make them throw down their weapons. Because you got to just know when, when, the, when, that, when the, um, the Arabian or the Syrian armies are inside of Syria, you got to just know they, I'm throwing down my weapon. I am surrounded. I am caught off guard. Or they could have taken a, an aggressive stance. The Bible says you ought to pray for your enemies. Not P-R-E-Y your enemies. Not P-R-E-Y on your enemies, but P-R-A-Y for your enemies. Isn't that, isn't that Bible? The king of Israel sees an easy victory. Man, th- this victory has been placed right in his hands. He could massacre them. It would not be the whole um, Syrian army because they didn't send the whole army. 
But these guys would never trouble Israel again. Now, their sons might. And some of the stuff America is going through right now, even with terrorists in the West, is because of massacres that have not been forgotten. I'm just saying. You got you to see both sides of it. You gotta, we've got to see the whole story. And so he says, and at this point in the history, he's a king that respects Elisha for the moment. He honors him. And he says, Father, can I kill him? <laughs> Father, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? Elijah says, no, you can't kill them. It would appear that Elijah wanted to embarrass his foes with kindness and impress them with the sufficiency of the power of Yahweh. And so what does he do? He advises the king, no, sit them down, feed them, give them something to drink, and then send them home. The Bible says that um, the king of Israel provides a feast and then sends them on their way. And then we read, the bands of Aram or Syria stopped raiding Israel's territory. Now, they could have took an aggressive approach and, and they would have had all the army after them then, but they, they, instead of doing that, they fed them. And I began to think, I said, that sounds so familiar. It, it, it's, it's as if Elijah read from the writings of Paul to Rome. In Romans 12, verse 14, where he says, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low positions. Do not be conceited. And here, listen, he says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. And if it's possible, as far as depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And listen to what he says. Do not take revenge, my dear friends. Leave room for God's wrath. Leave room. You, you want to you you take revenge. No, God says, leave room. Let me take care of this. It's mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. But listen to what he says. On the contrary, here it is. If your enemy is hungry, and man, it's as if he read Paul's letter. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heat burning coals on his head. Can you, can you think that those guys went back saying, man, that was some good food, man. I ain't never ate that good. Man, those folks ain't half bad. They ain't, it, man, I, they, man I, the, what the king was telling us about them, I don't know. Folks don't even know you, but they've already made up their mind about you. And when you get the opportunity, you need to show them who you are. I know what, I know what Ms. Obama says. She says when somebody shows you who they are, believe them. So you need to show them who you are as disciples of Christ, as believers of the high, the most powerful God. And Paul describes how we ought to show them who you are, that the very character of Christ may come out through your life. And so I ask you, what do you see? Some of us need to ask God to help us to see beyond the bad so we can see the reality of the good. Some of us need to ask God to see Help us to see beyond the good so we can see the reality of the bad. 
We need to ask God to help us to see what we really need to see, not so that we would lose heart, not because of the plight that we're in, but to see the truth behind what got us here. We don't need to minimize or magnify our predicament. Yes, the problems, the disencouragements, the dangers are all real. But the deliverance and remedy is much more real. Christ died on the cross to deliver, to provide redemption and reconciliation. He died to set us free. So we need to see things and see people from God's point of view with spiritual insight and faith. What may seem one way from outside of faith takes on a whole different view when it's seen from inside of faith. You see things differently when you're connected and active participant within a church community of faith. Looking at the situation through the eyes of fear and unbelief. Situation looks hopeless. But viewed from inside the cathedral of faith, through the eyes of God, through, through the periscope of the word of God, from the the atmosphere of the community of faith, we see the divine resources becoming more clearly visible. Seeing is believing. That's the motto of the culture, of our world that we live in. Seeing is believing, but the, but the, the people of faith would say, believing is seeing. The problem is not the major part of the problem. The problem is not the problem. But the problem is how we see the problem. What we fail to see is the problem. Where we fail to look is another part of the problem. Psalms chapter 20, David says, The Lord gives victory to his anointed. He answers him from his heavenly sanctuary with victorious power of his right hand. Then he says, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord. Do I have a witness here? But we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They are brought to their knees and fall, but we rise and stand firm. So yes, I took my medication this morning and I took my vitamins. But my trust is in the Lord. I go to medical checkups, I have annual exams. And when they see something, I check it out. But my trust is in the Lord. Yes. I I plan to go back to the gym. (laughs) Brother Mike, plan to go back to the gym and exercise at home. But my trust is in the Lord. I want to lose more weight. I'm going to eat better and healthier. But my trust is in the Lord. Yes. We put our seat belts on when we get in the car. We put our seat belts on when we're on the plane. But our trust is in the Lord. Yes, we put money away for retirement. But our trust is in the Lord. Yes, we utilize medical insurance, life insurance, home insurance, auto insurance, long-term care insurance, disability insurance, but my trust, our trust is in the Lord. Yes, we've had surgeries with doctors and nurses, real flesh and blood, doctors, nurses, anesthesiologists, but our trust is in the Lord. Yes, we've taken the COVID-19 vaccination and the booster. But our trust is in the Lord. So when you look at the congregation, 
do you see? When, when you look at your family, what do you see when you look at the church of God? Anderson, Indiana, what do you see? When you look at the National Association of the Church of God, West Middlesex, Pennsylvania, what do you see when you look at the country? When you look at your community, what do you see? You look at the city, when you look at the planet, bring it even home, when you look in the mirror, what do you see? I submit that we need to ask the Lord to open our eyes so that when we look, we would see beyond just the problem. That when we look, we would not look through rose-colored glasses and only see the good. God, open our eyes so that we may see. So my brother, my sister, Mom, dad, my sons and daughters, what do you see? I've got some hopes as I close. On this last Sunday in November 2021, I hope someone who's heard this message will see that God has already provided everything they need or he's provided the path, or he's provided the door, or he's provided the person God has already provided. I hope that someone will see that they've, been, they've placed their trust or their hope in the wrong place. God, open their eyes to see that they've put their trust in a political party. Help them to see that they put their trust in things other than you. I, I hope someone will see that they're standing or they've taken the wrong position in a matter and they can't see clearly. And maybe you're on the roof and you're saying, no, God's going to rescue me. You are confused. God is trying to help you. But if you choose, I'm not saying you're going to go to hell. But if you choose to stay on the roof and refuse the rescue that God has provided, don't bring your, your, your children with you. Don't let your children get rescued. Let, let your family get rescued. Let, let your spouse get rescued. Let your church get rescued. I hope someone will see that the Lord has equipped you. He has positioned you for such a time as this. He's positioned you, equipped you, empowered you to serve his purposes, to share the gospel. To disciple someone to Christian maturity. He has positioned you. I want you to see that. Open your eyes to see that it's not someone else that he's calling. He's calling you. I hope a husband or wife will see that marriage works 100% of the time. When we follow the Lord's plans. When we follow his blueprints. In his power. And that they would see that their plan, the plan of their parents or their grandparents, the plan of this culture is destined to fail. Yeah. I hope that some young man, some young woman will see the world around them with divine insight, with anointed perception, with unquenchable hope. And with an un, a, a relentless commitment to the will and the ways of God. I hope that someone will see that there's healing for the nations. There is racial healing with, for the church. There's, there's healing for the nations in Christ. And the church has been given the message, the means, and the mandate for reconciliation. 
I hope that someone will see. If they look in the mirror, both their lostness and the Savior who loves them, you are already loved. You don't have to earn his love. He loves you right now. He's provided salvation and redemption for you right now. And he calls to you to come to him and find true life. I'm going to ask that you bow your heads and close your eyes and let's pray. God, God, I pray. I pray that you would open our eyes. I pray, God, that you would open the eyes of those that are looking on virtually, dear God. Open our eyes to your salvation that you've already prepared. Open eyes to the resources that you've already provided. Open eyes to the direction and guidance that you have already provided. Father, I pray that you would open eyes to the life, the kind of life that you died to give us. Father, I pray that you would open eyes to the will and the ways of Jehovah God. Father, I pray that you would open our eyes in every season of our life, whether we're in the spring, the summer, the, the autumn, or the winter of our lives, open up our eyes. And Lord, open up our eyes in how we see each other, how we see people. Because God, we treat people the way we see people. Open our eyes. At this stage of our lives, open our eyes. We want to see you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. You believe God. Look for God this week. Open up your eyes and see what God is saying to you. hear what God is telling you to do. He may tell you to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. He may tell you to do something that just doesn't seem to make sense. But I tell you like Mary told those servants and the Lord told them at that wedding feast of Canaan, fill them with water. Whatever he tells you to do, Amen. I pray that you are challenged. I pray that as we come to the end of 2021, and of God's tarry as we go into 2022, that you will continuously ask yourself, what do I see? <laughs> don't, don't stop at the first look. What do I see? Get a good perspective. Get a different perspective. Where do I see? Don't just read books by black authors. Where do I see? Don't just read books by white authors. Where do I see? He said that the victor tells the story. What do you see? I hope you enjoyed that message, and I hope that you will like and subscribe to this channel. If you want to experience a live service, be with us at this same channel next week on Sunday at 10.30 a.m. Until next time, God bless you.